Today is September 5th, 2001. We're in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is John Coates. We are pleased to have with us for the second time Henry Bengus. This conversation is part two, a continuation of the tape we began with Henry in this place on August 20th this year. In part one, he told us of his experiences as a B-17 bomber pilot during the Second World War. He was shot down on September 11th, 1944, and crash landed in Belgium. He and his crew survived, but were immediately captured by German soldiers. We're going to pick up today with events that led to his internment at Stalag Luftwaffe, located in Barth, Germany. But first, I believe, Henry, you said you had a couple of experiences that you didn't tell us last time and you would like to include on in the tape. Go back to wartime London, then. Well, in wartime London, my, my most um, memorable day was um, we had a two-day stand down after flying um, several consecutive days and some rough missions. And at the time, um, General Eisenhower introduced to the military uniform, what was called the Eisenhower jacket, the old long jacket that was standard issue, uh, was being modernized and it was down to the um, uh, belt buckle or belt uh, height. And uh, myself and a few crew members went into a tailor shop in London near Piccadilly Circus, which is like Times Square in New York. And we were in this small tailor shop when the air raid siren went off and we were told to go down into the cellar. And we went into the cellar, down the steps, and um, we were there a couple of minutes and the all clear sounded. And um, we started up the steps and then another siren went off which meant immediate vicinity. So we were told to rush down the steps again and as we were going down the steps, there's a loud explosion and the plaster and glass started to fall from the uh, uh, narrow hallway going into the uh, cellar. And then they blew the all clear and we came up and there were, was dust and uh, plaster and glass in the street. A buzz bomb, which was the V1, hit the, uh, the uh, roof facade of the Regent Palace Hotel and just blown off the side of this uh, big monstrous hotel and it was kind of a scary scary time for us but um, we had our jackets made incidentally and we brought them back to the base very very fashionable I hope so after what you went through to get it oh yes the, the <laughs> other thing you wanted to tell us about was the uh, the bombing record of your outfit uh, how many missions and that kind of thing? Well, yes, uh, I mentioned in our first tape that the, um, our commanding officer, uh, General uh, uh, Maurice Preston, he was a colonel at that time, he was promoted to wing commander and his successor came from the 303rd Bomb Group and his, was Colonel Lewis E. Lyle. And he uh, took over the 379th about three weeks after I was shot down, so I never knew him during the uh, time of the 379th at Kim Bolton. However, uh, this man uh, had the most honorable record of any of the um, bomb group leaders. There were some more famous people. However, General Lyle flew more lead missions than any other group commander and several many of those missions were as leader of the 8th Air Force which up, went up to between a thousand and fifteen hundred planes. There was over a hundred miles a parade or a almost a, an air traffic jam of, of a length of about a hundred miles or more planes going in. Well General Lyle flew over 80 missions and many of those was uh, that's more than more than three original tours, which were 25 missions. So to me, that's a hero. This man was uh, fearless, competent, great leader. Uh, we had two of the best at, uh, at the 379th. I, I can't think of any better. As I said a few minutes ago, there was um, more famous names, um, but none better. 
I'm glad you told us that. That's a name not to be lost in history, and uh, now you've made it part of the books. Well, he's still active. He is still, as a matter of fact, I will see him at our next reunion in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania on October the 3rd. Uh, he comes to all our reunions, and um, he's still a vibrant, energetic man. I don't know his exact age, but it's got to be early 80s. So he achieved a lot at a young age when he was flying in England. Shake his hand for us if you will. I sure will. I'm going to bring these tapes along too if he's interested in uh, Oh, you know, that, that would be very nice. Let's get down now to where we left off last time. You'd been shot down. You were a prisoner of war or on your way to being. So the first question today is, considering the possibilities of your being forced down, shot down, did the United States Air Force prepare you for the possibility of being a prisoner of war? Yes, they told us that uh, the best scenario would be if we were shot down to be taken by the Luftwaffe because they were more um, sympathetic to American flyers. Uh, the second best scenario would have been the, um, the Wehrmacht, which was the German uh, so, uh, foot soldier. Uh, the two worst, and the worst of all, was to be taken by civilians because many of those men were killed by farmers, by street people with pitchforks and, and clubs. Uh, then the SS would be uh, another or a scary situation. Case. Yeah. What did you know, or what had you been told about the Geneva Convention and your rights as a prisoner of war? Not very much, except that the, uh, the Germans were observing, or supposed to be observing, the um, Geneva Convention rules. And uh, our, um, our own individual rank and file people, we didn't have uh, a lot of details on it. However, the leaders of our, our group did, and uh, they couldn't pass on too much to us, so we were just winging it, so to speak. I'm going to confess that uh, it took me a while to find Barth, where, the, where your camp was, mm -hmm. on a map. And for viewers of this tape, I'm going to try and locate it as best I can. Stalag Luft I was about as far up in the northeast corner of Germany at the edge of the Baltic Sea as you could get without getting your feet wet. Poland was to your east, Germany lay to the west and the south, and north across the Baltic Sea was occupied Denmark or neutral Sweden. Correct. So I guess I'm leading up to the question is, escape, if it were possible, led to the question, escape to where? Well, uh, the two obvious ones were one to try to catch a ride on a freighter going up to uh, neutral Sweden, or to make their way down by rail. Um, that was probably the only way they could have gotten out, but to do that you needed documents, and if anyone has uh, seen the movie The Great Escape, our camp also had um, people from all occupations, artists, photographers, uh, tailors, so they could make uh, civilian clothes out of military uniforms. And the, the uh, papers, travel papers, uh, that were necessary had to be dated because they ran out yet to have them renewed. Uh, those were all forged. And we had some clandestine uh, cameras uh, that would take pictures to put on these uh, ID uh, documents. Uh, there was one famous man who was, his first name was Roger. I don't recall his last name, but he escaped from three different camps, including Stalag Luft I, and he eventually was sent down to the so-called escape-proof uh, camp in, I think it was number three, Stalag Luft III. Um, and they got out 74 or 76 men on an escape. They built three tunnels at one time, but they, um, they were concentrating on one tunnel, and that's the one that they, they got out of. Um, he was one of 50 people that was captured later on. He made, him, made his way uh, almost in, into France, actually, and uh, German SS or um, undercover operators were checking all buses and trains, and uh, he and a, 
and an accompanied uh, XPOW were boarding a bus, and the German says, have a nice day, and he said, thank you, in English, and yeah, that was the end of Roger, and uh, yeah. he was murdered by the, uh, by the SS. We all have seen the movies, The Great Escape among them, mm -hmm. about protocol and um, how to be, how restrictions were placed on you, not only by the Germans, but by the Americans. There was a kind of hierarchy within the camp. Was there an escape committee in your camp? Yes, there was. Um, in the earlier tape, I mentioned that I had several articles. We were issued what was called a, um, um, an escape kit. It was a plastic box, I would say six inches by four inches by about an inch thick. And in it were uh, maps printed on silk, uh, French francs, uh, high energy uh, chocolate bar, a little sewing kit, and a three inch hacksaw blade, and that sort of thing. When we arrived at uh, Stalagluf 1, we were interrogated by our people. We had security, our own security in the camp, and uh, they told us that there would be no conversations with any of the people in our assigned barracks until we were cleared to be legitimate POWs, because the Germans were, were um, infiltrating in some areas. So I donated all of my escape kit items to the escape committee. Um, Who ran the committee? Well, again, it started with the uh, senior allied officer. There were four compounds eventually in our camp. It started with um, with South Compound, which was strictly RAF because they were in war first and alone. And as more Americans got in and were shot down, they expanded it to North 1, and then North 2, North 3. Those were the four compounds in the camp. So they had uh, each, each commander of each compound reported to the senior allied staff. And again, Colonel Zemke was our uh, CO. Prior to him, it was a British officer. I think it was captured at Dunkirk. Um, long time, a long time. But um, if you had a plan, you approached your barracks commander who passed it on. If your plan was shot down, that was the end of it. Anyone who had a legitimate chance of getting out, they listened to him and helped them where they could. I think that's uh, my next question. They decided who could get out and when and um, who could tunnel out, who could not. Mm -hmm. You weren't supposed to freelance your way out of the place. No, they, they discouraged that because the failure rate early in the camp, the, the failure rate was so high, uh, they decided to, like everything else you learn by your mistakes, that they would help you if there was a legitimate chance of getting out. They would help you in any way with, again, documents, money, uh, language, travel routes, and so on. Were there escapes from your camp? There were. Uh, I, not that I knew of while I was there. Now, I arrived there in um, about mid-September of 44. Uh, more escapes earlier than later. What was the penalty um, if you got caught? What did the Germans do to you? Well, they had a building called the Cooler. And what it was, it was solitary confinement, and all you got was Kriegsbrot, which is war bread, which we considered 50% sawdust, 50% flour, and water. And it was, you were in isolation, and there was, the only ventilation was a slotted, very high window, very high off the floor, so you could not look out. And the slots on it were angled upward, so you couldn't look down on the ground. The Germans were pretty clever in, in the way they handled that thing. And, you had no exercise except walking around his very small cell. And that was the penalty. The length of time was determined by the infraction. There was an American officer, I think his name was Spicer, who was in, in solitary about three months. And uh, when a camp was, was liberated, uh, the press thing he went up, did, they went up to the uh, cooler to release Colonel Spicer. And, uh, he wanted to stay one more day, which would have made it in even three months, I believe it was. And when he came out, the, um, the pathway, the roadway leading into the uh, North One compound was lined on both sides with 
American, these were all American flyers in our compound, uh, cheering him, and a lot of tears were shed, and it would be like a celebrity parade today. He was quite a man. Like the scene in the River Kwai. Yes, exactly. yes, that's right. I never thought about that, but that was uh, very similar. During the war, my notes uh, tell me that 35,000 British and American and Canadians escaped from captivity in, uh, at the hands of the Germans. Mm -hmm. Did you hear about these exploits or uh, their successes? Well, we, the only ones that uh, we knew about were the ones who were um, brought back to um, uh, British control or American control in, in Britain. And um, there weren't a lot of them, and we didn't hear too much about them, but we knew some of them had escaped. Uh, there were uh, evades, I guess, was the term that they used, and there were many more that were uh, crashed into the um, English Channel or the North Sea, and uh, the English had remarkable rec recovery uh, tactics with their speed, high-speed boats and fishing these people out of the uh, water in little rafts. But as far as um, uh, return prisoners, not too many. We heard also some that were so badly um, uh, injured that they were repatriated first to Britain and then eventually back home to the States. I should think it would be difficult if a guy uh, takes off for him to ever tell you he made it or got, got on the freighter, as you said earlier, or walked uh, to Denmark or whatever mm -hmm. it took um, for any kind of a feedback as to what works and what doesn't. I got caught because, mm -hmm. which would be very useful information for you. We really, I never heard of any of that myself firsthand. After the war, yes, but... Uh, too late. Too late, yeah. yeah. In September, when you entered the camp, there were 6,000 prisoners of war uh, inside the wire. Mm -hmm. At the time of liberation, there were almost 10,000 American and British. Tell us how that affected, that continuous crowding affected your well, life. Well, the 6,000 were in Stalag Luf 1. There were many Stalags, uh, Stalag Lufs, um, but that was our camp. Actually, it started out as strictly an officer's camp. We had a few non-commissioned officers who were uh, in charge of the hallway in the barracks. Each barracks room was responsible for the occupants of that room. So it wasn't any kind of menial um, labor or anything that these uh, non-commissioned officers did. But uh, the camp, it started with 6,000, you're right, when I got there, and it eventually got up to around 10, due to the fact that more and more planes were being shot down and uh, after the Battle of the Bulge, there was a group of uh, prisoners that were brought in as best way they could by train, horse and wagon, or wagon being pushed and pulled by their compatriots. So it swelled to that uh, number. In, st in um, compound North 3, they had a group of um, prisoners that were, tra were transferred from another Stalag and they were all non-commissioned officers, and they were unruly, they were renegades. They were stealing, they were cheating, and they uh, were brought to the attention of the senior allied officer, Colonel Zemke, who went to them and told them that was the last insurrection that they were going to perform because he was going to see that they were court-martialed with a life imprisonment if they didn't stay in line and conform to the rules and regulation, our rules and regulation of behavior in the camp. And from that day forward, they never had any problem. That's also documented in a book called Zemke's Stalag. Um, he wrote it along with Roger Freeman, who was the British, um, oh, what would I say, historian for the 8th Air Force. He wrote many, many books and he, in conjunction with Colonel Zepke, put this book together. It's interesting reading. Traditionally, um, the guys who own the camps own you. Um, no matter if you were in a Japanese camp or a German camp, 
Did they did the Germans attempt to instill Nazi indoctrination, um, get you in classes and tell you what a guy, nice guy Hitler was? No, I don't think they um, they re they realized that we would not buy any of this scam, and uh, no attempt was made while I was there. Even the um, the German guards or goons uh, with their little ferrets who were snooping around the camp. Um, tried any anything like that, they would have been laughed down. We had it better than they had it, really. Well, as long as the uh, Red Cross parcels were coming in, the food parcels. So it was, uh, we had the upper hand, except that we were being held prisoner. Let's put two things together here. Uh, you mentioned ferrets here, and you mentioned that you were warned not to talk to anybody until you were officially cleared into the camp. Correct. Did the Germans put uh, stool pigeons in among you guys, and uh, ostensibly an American prisoner? Not that we saw in our camp. It was done, and again, that was in that movie, uh, The Great Escape. Um, no, Starlog uh, 13, or whatever it was called. It was another movie. 17. Starlog 17, OK. Uh, no, we had none of that. Uh, infiltration attempt. The last time uh, you and I talked at, toward the end, you told us about the upside of being in the camp, Those, the funny posters you hung up uh, to kid the guys coming in from the Ardennes, and you participated in the production of a play, uh, The Man Who Came to Dinner, was that it? That's correct. What about the, the darker side of your captivity? Um, the, the, the German guards shot men in your camp compound. No, uh, the compound actually, and again, this was in the um, in the movie. Uh, there was a warning wire which was about uh, 25 feet from the main uh, barbed wire compound. It was a double barbed wire fence. I would say 10 to 12 feet high. Uh, when I say double, it were about three feet apart, and inside were coils of barbed wire. Uh, so if you cross the, the warning wire, which was a straight strand of wire, uh, the guards had the, the right to shoot you. And most of the time, if anything happened, they would fire a warning shot. And I didn't hear of too many of those. So the, the men were pretty well aware of the danger of uh, things. But we had other ways of facing danger, sometimes crazy, but... Uh, Tell us about one of those. Well, the, um, the cans of, um, of foodstuffs that we got in our Red Cross parcels, um, the Germans punctured every can, so, every can so you could not save it. However, we used to melt the margarine and fill up the holes, which would, would not keep the, the food indefinitely, but it would uh, help prevent the um, spoiling. Well, when the food was removed from the cans, we uh, stripped the, the paper labels off the cans, and we had some crude, issued, um, hand-turned can openers. So we cut the ends off of each can, which made it a tube. And they assembled a group of tubes and fitted one end into the next can, and so on. And they built a tube that was approximately three feet long. And the wild sense of humor the Americans had. I guess that maybe had a board or something. But they took the corrugated cartons that the Red Cross parcels came in. It was an 11-pound carton, I would say, it was maybe 15 inches square and about four or five inches high. And uh, they built a, uh, a series of, um, of uh, platforms. First, they started with wood slats from our bed, made a base, and then they put these corrugated boxes on top of that. And they put this uh, tube into one of the boxes at the top of this mound of, of uh, corrugated cartons. And they painted the whole thing out of paint that was issued by the YMCA. They mixed the olive drab color, which was the standard of uh, every military except the Navy. And uh, it was very legitimate. And one day, on a very beautiful sunny day, uh, the door, double doors opened at one end of a barracks. And a group of 15, 20, 25 men in close order surrounded this object and carried it out to near the warning wire of a, 
of one of the uh, guard towers, and the men dispersed, and sitting on a box was this man who was running a gun, and he turned the barrel of these, this tube of, of cans up to the tower, and the German guard almost fell out of the tower. He didn't know what was happening. And they picked up his rifle, and then everybody scattered. It was stupid, it was funny, it was crazy. End of joke. End of joke. It was a, well, it could have been serious, too, but amazing. How about diets uh, that consisted of 800 calories a day toward the end? Well, that was the rough part. When the, um, when the Allies were advancing, our food came through Sweden. It was packed by the army, distributed through the Red Cross. Uh, when they cut off the ports, the, um, the ships start, stopped coming in because they had to arrange some sort of a transfer between the Allies and the Germans. And the CO of our camp, the German CO of our camp, met with our own CO, and uh, they got painted a large German truck white, and they put Red Cross um, lettering on the roof. It was a canvas-covered truck. And on the sides and on, a, on the tailboard and on the, um, the hood of the engine. And they got German guards with an American, two American drivers in case they were challenged anywhere along the line with a, what they called a, um, a parole, which meant that um, you were safe to go without being challenged. Uh, but there was about a, I'd say, a six to seven week span where we had nothing except German uh, rations, which were meager. And I mentioned in the first interview that uh, my weight dropped from about 175 down to somewhere near 100, 100, 110 max. So our diet was curtailed. And as I said earlier, you, you couldn't save food because it would spoil. When you guys were going hungry, were the Germans going hungry too? Absolutely, they had it worse than, our, than we did. Well, it wasn't probably as bad as we did because whatever came into the camp, they had first crack at it. And uh, we had a, a weekly ration of, of soup which had meat in it. And we knew it was horse meat uh, because there were no cows around. Uh, they had potatoes. Um, Rutabagas was very big on their, their list, and barley, those were the things. So they made a soup containing all of that. There was no onions in it, no, no flavoring whatsoever. They had salt in it too, but that was about it. You had no way of knowing it because it was happening uh, thousands of miles away from you. But in some Japanese camps, the guards simply walked in, killed everybody, and, and left the camp because mm -hmm. they were pressed to go to take care of the homeland. Right. Did you ever wonder if your guards would do the same, kill you and just leave you? No, not really. Uh, the feeling was that, well, first of all, we had um, periodic visits from the um, Red Cross, International Red Cross from, from Switzerland. And uh, they didn't visit every man or every barracks, but they had enough of a cross section so that uh, barracks commanders would go up with a contingent of people from each barracks. We felt that we were in a pretty safe place. And looking back after the war, after we recovered, uh, Stalag Luft I was the best POW camp to be a Kriegi in or captive in. Uh, our treatment was the best. Our, the fact that we were stable, we were not moved. Many of these, most of these other camps were on a march, some for as much as three months in the winter time. Many men died in those uh, situations. Because of advancing, the, the battlefront changed and the camps were in the way. Yeah. Right, and they had a forage for food, and the Germans were responsible for, supposed to be responsible for, getting food for this, these hundreds and thousands of men on the march from various camps. Surely you guys talked about uh, being saved. Somebody's going to come and get us out of this place. Uh, were you aware of the Russians advancing from the east? And what was your feeling? Do you, what if they opened the gates? Well, we were aware. We had a radio in our camp, and the radio, uh, they passed messages between the compounds on official visits from commanders from different compounds. Uh, so we knew what was going on. We had a daily 
um, report from BBC, British Broadcasting, and we also had the German uh, reports on our radio. And actually, both sides claimed there was an overlap. So we kind of drew an imaginary line between our claims and their claims to get a pretty accurate situation. And we knew that the Russians, we were closer to Russian territory than we were to Allied territory. And the Russians were advancing at a greater rate than, uh, than our own people. So we knew that it would be the Russians eventually that, that got to our camp. And we were eventually told, stay put, they don't know you, you don't know them, you don't know what they're capable of, and so on. Some of them were pretty rough people. Uh, even their general was a very demanding guy. Um, and our own uh, allied senior officer, Colonel Zemke, had to deal with him um, and negotiate with him to get what, what he wanted. And okay, we'll, we'll get to them mm -hmm. opening your doors later, but um, the Russians are coming your way, and you, you're listening to radios on the BBC. Were these legal radios? Were no, you allowed no, to listen no, to them? No, no, we... Uh, I thought that was uh, <laughs> not, not done. Well, no, they had a, a radio that actually the radio was passed around to various people in, in different compounds, either north one or south, which was the original compound. And I don't know where the radio came from, whether they built it or they bought it with uh, cigarettes and cigars and chocolate and so on. But um, they knew we had a radio, but they could never find it. And again, relating back to the movie, uh, the same thing, it was hidden. We didn't know where it was, but we got a daily reading of the um, of the news. You were over that you were captured in September. Uh, that's the fall in Europe, the same as it is here, and you were pretty far north. Uh, you were over there in the winter at the edge of the Baltic Sea, which can be a pretty cold place. Were there deaths during that bitter winter in your camp? Not, not from cold. Uh, we were cold, and, and I may have related this in the first interview. I had on flying boots with an overboot, a shirling line overboot, which would have been warm, except that it wasn't practical in the camp because the underboot was a rubber sole, uh, like an electric blanket with a rubber sole on it. And uh, they took that away from me and gave me a pair of crude shoes, high uh, ankle-high shoes, unlined, uh, what they call a stitch-down construction, the cheapest possible way of making a shoe. And, um, we didn't stay outside too long in, um, in the snow or very cold weather. However, in the, in the fall, uh, we had plenty of time to stay outside with no discomfort, but I, I never heard of anyone dying from cold. What did, you, what did you burn for your stoves? Where did you get fuel? The most inefficient type of stove you can imagine. Uh, the grate of the stove was about three feet below the top of the stove where you could heat water. So we reconstructed the, the stove that the Germans had put in each room. Uh, as far as heat goes, there were um, one layer of board on the outside of the barracks. No liner, no double liner, just a thin board. Uh, they put uh, some of the corrugated cartons on the floor to prevent coal coming up through the floor. Uh, we didn't do this on the walls, but we did uh, sleep in our clothes very often. They issued us two blankets with no sheets. In those days, they had a, a mattress cover, which uh, was of no comfort. We had to redo our, we fluff our mattresses about every second day. But um, we had uh, two or three issues of clothing and uh, you just had to keep washing and reusing. And, but very often you slept in your clothes and definitely slept with your socks on. Same question I asked you about the food a moment ago. Mm -hmm. If you were cold, were the Germans cold too? No, well, they were cold, but not as cold as we were. They had better equipment. They had these heavy, long overcoats that they wore. They had underneath that, they had a heavyweight um, uh, blouse, I guess you'd call it, and, and trousers and better shoes. 
army issue uh, material, but they were cold, but not as cold as we were. We had no gloves, that's another thing too. They also had gloves. I suspect that in, in, in retrospect, thinking about it, that to be a guard at a, a camp like that was a heck of a lot better than being in Stalingrad. Absolutely, no doubt about it. Their, their uh, duty was really relatively easy. You know, they were just responsible for keeping order in the camp and uh, escapes down to a minimum or, or no escapes at all. So uh, they were following orders. It would be like standing guard duty at a, at a military base, uh, mm -hmm. checking into Hanscom Air Base. We have to pass the military police there, or air police. So um, it was kind of a cushy uh, assignment, I guess. You mentioned the Red Cross parcels, or, or parcels put together that uh, were shipped down from Sweden Correct. originally. When you got a parcel in a camp, was it yours, or were you expected to share it with other guys? Originally, uh, in North One, that's the first place I was, um, was put into, uh, each man was given a parcel, but the, the um, uh, commandant of, of the compound, who eventually was the uh, CEO of the camp, they took out uh, spam and corned beef and a couple of other items, and you got the rest. The reason for that was um, they had a communal mess. The rest of the things we could eat and snack on, but we had canned salmon, canned tuna, and so on. All that we kept to ourselves. There were crackers or biscuits in the uh, in the parcels. The Germans also issued a um, weekly ration of barley, and I don't know if you would call eating barley, but it could be cooked to the consistency of oatmeal. So what they would do would be to uh, cook up a batch of barley. We had our own bowls, our own ice forks and spoons, and we uh, ate at the communal mess. You brought your own cup, and uh, we had uh, instant coffee, and they would heat the water, and you could make your instant coffee, and we had a p powdered whole milk called Klim, which is milk, M-I-L-K, spelled backwards. It's still available. We find when we go to, the, to Aruba, we see it on the store shelves down there. Um, but the cumulative mess was, again, uh, SOS, cream, spam on, on, on toast. Uh, it's, uh, it was a standard GI joke, SOS. And yeah. Any military <laughs> people would know what that we'll is. We'll put a footnote on the tape. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the rest of the food, we, we could do with what we wanted. And some people would make, take the D-bars, which is a concentrated chocolate, and shave it and heat it into water and add some powdered whole milk and we had a hot chocolate, you know, and um, put a couple of lumps of sugar or something into it. When you watch uh, old movies or this one that runs forever on TV with uh, Colonel Klink, right. uh, evidently the, the Germans were stupid and the Americans always outwitted them is this true? No, no. That sold a lot of advertising. Uh, it drew a lot of viewers because it was, again, it was a humorous thing and they were poking fun at, at the enemy. Uh, it was not, uh, not anything like that. Were, the, were there rules of engagement? Were you told how to deal with the Germans? Did you make friends with them? Did, did you talk with them? Or were they strictly military guys? Well, the only, the only contact uh, we ever had as individuals in the camp when um, something official had to be done in the barracks or looked at in the barracks. For instance, we would pull nails out of the floorboard and uh, several, in several places so that they would report it and then a uh, carpenter would arrive with his little toolbox accompanied by a guard. And immediately when they got into the room, they showed them where the loose floorboards were and somebody would offer both the carpenter and the guard a cigarette, but they made them turn away to face them, which was away from the toolbox. And while they were taking their cigarette and, uh, cigarettes and lighting them, we pilfered whatever we needed from the toolbox, mainly clippers. That was the, uh, the main thing, to cut wire. 
you just by chance <laughs> happen to be holding a piece of wire. <laughs> I wonder if you'd hold it up so that we could take a look at it. This is actually a strand of barbed wire from Stalag Luft I in Bath, Germany that when we were liberated, I, uh, I brought this along. I wasn't much for souvenirs, but this was one item. It's an actual piece of Stalag Luft's security fence. And along with that, I, uh, when we were liberated, I, we were privileged to go up and, and retrieve our records from the, um, from the camp. And this was one of the items that I, I took with me. This was an armband that the, um, the guards wore over their uniform to uh, identify themselves as, uh, as captives. Don't, don't ever lose those. Those are uh, priceless. Good to have. <laughs> yeah. But the, but the barbed wire is, I'll never forget this. This is uh, an item that. Uh, you could put uh, that in a nice frame, you know, and um, keep it that way. Well, I was thinking of maybe gilding it, but then it would take away from the actual. That uh, would kill it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. When you, as the war moved along and you get up toward the spring of 45, surely the Germans knew that things were not going too well. Did their attitude towards you change? Became more friendly. There was less um, formal German military uh, feeling in the camp. Uh, things weren't easy, but they weren't as um, as nasty as, as they could have been. You know, with the advancing Russians, especially, they were preparing themselves to evacuate. Uh, evacuate but not necessarily with you. Well, the, the order came down to uh, Colonel Zemke that uh, the German CO wanted to take, <coughs> take prisoners along as hostages. And Colonel Zemke uh, told the uh, commandant, German commandant, that nobody was leaving the camp. And the Germans said, well, we have guns and we can kill you. And Colonel Zemke said, that's true, you can kill some of us. But remember, there's about 10,000 of us. We'll kill all of you if you take anybody Absolutely. out of this camp. Can I use a word here and in, 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 see how objective we can be? Were the Germans fair to you? Yeah, I can't complain. Uh, I believe that maybe some of the, I was only there eight months, but I believe some of the longtime people may have felt that they didn't get the best treatment. But when I look back and talk to, personally talk back to, um, prisoners from other camps. And there's a friend of mine who was in, in, lives in Westboro, who um, was a captor, captive in um, Stalag Luft III, I think it was. Um, they, they had it rough all the way along. And ours, I guess you would be, say, the Cadillac of POW camps. But our own state prison here was called Cedar Junction. A beautiful name, terrible place. <laughs> but we had a I would say fair treatment. I, I can't, uh, you know, they didn't make it easy. They wanted you to, to uh, fight for everything that was rightfully yours and, and make demands on things that were uh, maybe not supposed to be available. Colonel Zemke was a, an excellent negotiator and uh, he got just about everything he wanted. You just mentioned Cedar Junction. Um, if you've ever been in it, e even visiting, you know that there's steel doors that slam and traps guys looking at you from up above. And there's a huge sense of finality when that door slams behind you. Let's take you as, a, as an individual, a person. You're not too old. You're a young man, an American, and suddenly you're in a prison camp. You're in a prison camp. Was survival there based on the group ethic or was it a very personal thing? How did you guys survive? Did you work together as a team or were there 10,000 individuals just trying to see nope. tomorrow? Actually, we were all in the same boat, so to speak. Um, there was a camaraderie that developed. Uh, not every, we were 20 men in a room. Not every one of the 20 was uh, very friendly to every other one of the 20. 
uh, you made more personal friends than with some than with others. We had one individual in our room who was, he fell through the cracks, he was an officer, but the sloppiest, dirtiest officer I've ever run across in my three years in the service. Uh, and his fa father was a military officer. They had no conception of what things were like in our camp. And the fellow in our room used to do his laundry by putting the dirty clothes into a corrugated box. And when the box was filled, he turned over the box and took whatever was on top. As it was his cleanest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was his change of clothing. Perfect sense to me. <laughs> but then his father and mother would write him and say, we hope you en are enjoying your stay in the camp. Because they had a lot of German prisoners and he came from Texas. Or as they say down there, Texas. Uh, his father donated a set of golf clubs to the German prisoners down in Texas so they could enjoy themselves while they were playing. They had a lot more freedom and liberty here than we had there. Different ball game. You spoke uh, before of a bunch of rowdies that came into the camp, and you made very clear they were enlisted men. But beyond that, you just talk about the fact that you had to operate as a team. Right. Were there men who betrayed the group? Never heard of a single one. This was a, a group of people, as I said, who were in the same situation, and we were making the best of it. We, we knew that eventually we would be recovered because the Germans, even at, in September of 45, 44, when, when I was shot down, our advancing was slow but steady. We were definitely going to take over all of Germany, and we had no doubt about it. So we were living out our time under the German uh, situation. Uh, we had uh, feeling for each other. We had respect, and that's something you know you don't see around all the time today. Uh, but occasionally, there are a few people. Now, those those rowdies that I mentioned, uh, they actually were not Air Force people. This was these was was ground personnel who were on their own and uh, doing what they wanted to do. So I knocked them because they came into a stable situation and they were going to break all the rules and do what they wanted until Colonel Zemke read them the riot, riot act. And uh, it did straighten them out. We had no problem with it since then. This was not in my compound, but the compound next to me. You told us a moment ago that you, you had a radio and you got some news from them. But when they let in, a, took in a whole bunch of guys from the Ardennes, wasn't this a, a bunch of fresh news that came to you about how the opera, the army was operating, uh, where they were going and what they were doing? Were, were you, did you have access to these people? We, well, we had access to the people, but we didn't get any news from them that we hadn't heard uh, on the radio, just that we knew a lot of them were captured under very bad conditions. The temperature was down below zero. Um, their clothing wasn't adequate, the snow was knee deep. All the bad things that could have happened, happened to them. And when they eventually arrived at our camp, the, um, they were in, in bad shape. And we took care of them as best we could, including, I think I mentioned earlier, instead of our regular weekly um, parcel from the Red Cross, uh, they were going to give us a holiday package, which instead of Spam, we had turkey, canned turkey, and cranberry sauce, and canned sweet potatoes, and that sort of thing, uh, canned cherries. So instead of every man getting a parcel, they were a new group of people coming in. We had to form combines where five men would share four parcels in order to give the new incoming prisoners the same as we had. So they were treated fairly and equally. As, as everybody else. There was no rank in the camp except uh, Colonel Zemke. Uh, there was no saluting except with Colonel Zemke. He was informal, but military, strictly military. For somebody who's never, never been in the situation you were in, let me ask you this. How did you pass the time? Well, um, 
I mentioned earlier that the uh, Red Cross and the YMCA had given us many things. The YMCA gave us the costumes and makeup and so on for our men who came to dinner production. They also supplied us with uh, sporting equipment. We had softballs, gloves, bats, and bases, and we had softball leagues. When I say leagues, it's plural because there were 200 men in the barracks, so every barracks could have its own league. However, all of them did not play, and uh, there was a rumor that one of the, one of the uh, teams in the league did not have enough men to field the team, so a German guard played first base for them. He, his family had emigrated to the United States, and they went back for a visit, and ba-boom, they were cut off. They weren't allowed to leave Germany, and he wound up as a guard in our camp. He spoke English, which was a uh, requirement for uh, many of the guards. And he could play baseball, so he played softball, and he was on one of the teams. That's what I heard. I, I, I don't recall this, though. I remember it now. This is quite a few years ago, 57 years ago. Um, okay, we played baseball, volleyball. They actually had ice skates and hockey equipment, and we had to pay the Germans. They built a mound of dirt around an area, and they flooded it. The Germans charged us for the water to go into this thing, and, and they had an ice rink. Well, the rink it was a, a the, surface. The puck was extra. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Supply your own puck. Okay, what else did they give us? Um, volleyball, softball, football. They brought a football. We had touch football games which kind of got out of hand a little bit. You know, it's uh, somebody pushed too hard or hit too hard or something, and then words and, and hands were exchanged, fists were exchanged. They also gave us um, books. We had a, a library in each compound. They gave us some records. When I say records, today everything is CD or tape. Then it was 78 RPM. That's the oldest of the records. It went from 78 to 33 and a third to 45. So this was the old fashioned record. And we had a record player, which was not electric, it was hand wound, and the record would last until the end of the spring when you wound it up. Uh, we had people from all walks of life. Uh, we had architects, and I actually attended a, a class given by a couple of architects in, um, in designing houses. And I actually designed a, a six-room house. But remember, this was 1944, so we didn't have the thought of a second bathroom or a half bathroom. We didn't have an attached car garage. But the design, the general design of the house, I think would, would sell today right here in Natick, Massachusetts. And I'm planning to have it copyrighted. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. We may have touched on this in the first tape, but how did you communicate with home? Was there uh, such a thing as mail call at, at the camp? Yes, uh, you were allowed four postcards, and actually it was about the size of a standard American postcard, and not too much space on it for the message because a lot of it was for address. Uh, we were allowed four postcards and three letters. The letters were a single sheet of paper that was folded in three, and on the outside, of course, was the address to where it was to be sent. And um, I got a few letters from home, not as many as I wrote. I wrote not only to my wife, my, my mother, I should say. Uh, I wrote to a cousin of mine that I worked with at Picatinny Arsenal. And uh, she was very protective of my, of my mother. And uh, until she died, uh, we, we were the closest of, uh, of relations. A very, very wonderful woman. But so that was my most of my contact. I wrote to a few friends too who uh, were mm -hmm. not in the service. When you were in there, uh, if I get this right, about three months, Christmas came, mm -hmm. New Year's came. Right. Um, can you look back fifty some years now and tell us how you felt your mood Christmas in a, in a prison camp? But you also knew that the war was probably going in your direction. With these mixed thoughts, take us back to that year in, in Christmas of 44. Well, I, I would say the uh, sense of humor that we had was a necessary thing to have. It, 
It prevented moods from sinking down to the lower depths. Um, the fact that we were getting a Christmas parcel was a recognition of the coming holidays. Um, but we knew it was almost another day in the camp. We had no uh, religious leaders in the camp, but we had uh, people leading a, a service uh, to get us through the holy days anyway. And as far as New Year's go, Guy Lombardo couldn't make it to our camp, so we never heard Auld Lang Syne played by Guy Lombardo. That was a loss. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> a want, no, that was Lawrence Welk, the one in it, so. <laughs> Uh, Guy Lombardo, of course, was the uh, the man who played uh, Auld Lang Syne on uh, on radio. Because in those days, radio was was television with no pictures. Eh? So we we got all of our music the old-fashioned way. He played out of some New York hotel. There maybe the Rainbow Room or something. No, something. no. It, um, uh, Guy Lombardo was. Uh, I'll think of the name of it okay. probably tomorrow. We'll talk about it tomorrow. <laughs> Toward the end, you, you, Christmas or the, the holidays, uh, that's three months. January is four, February is five. Mm -hmm. March is six months. You're in that place six months. Did you begin to give up or did you think, no, I'm going to get out of this place? No, we didn't give up because, again, we knew the Allies were advancing. When I say Allies, I'm talking about the British, American, uh, Canadian coming from the West and the, uh, the Russians advancing from the East. So we, we knew it was coming. It was just a matter of time and, and sweating out the, uh, the daily routines. So it was, uh, no, no hope was lost. Okay, let's, let's take the larger word morale. Mm -hmm. um, surely, if you were locked up in the best place, if you were locked up in the Ritz Carlton in Boston, and somebody, I'll take that. And somebody can, yeah. tells you, you can't leave this place, that's not too good a situation. What about cabin fever multiplied by 10,000 guys? Well, I think that's a plus, because the, the 10,000 guys were comrades. Just about every, almost every one of them was a comrade. So you lived off of the hope and the enthusiasm and the camaraderie of your fellow Kriegis. So again, we were all in it together, and we, uh, we made the best of it. It was, uh, we had, as I said, the American sense of humor was phenomenal. The British sense of humor was just as good. Uh, my, my favorite humor in all the world is, is the British. Uh, Very dry but clever. My favorite word, clever, clever. Look at all the hit television shows that appeared on the public uh, broadcasting. Uh, if, if you watch them and listen, you can't sit there but help laugh. Faulty Towers. Faulty yeah, Towers. Okay. Basil Faulty, yes. Are you being served? <laughs> <laughs> Captain <laughs> Peacock. <laughs> mm. We, just a second ago, you touched a moment upon religion, and did I hear you correctly, there was no organized religion, there were no chaplains? No? We, we had no chaplains in the camp, but several of the people um, conducted, um, I, w I wouldn't say up on a pretty regular basis, uh, any people who wanted to come in, and uh, we had Bibles. Um, not everybody had a Bible, but there were Bibles in the camp, and they had uh, people come and pray and, and uh, these are lay led services. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Was there a Bible in your survival kit? No, no Bible. Um, you know, come to think of it, that, that would have been a good, even a, uh, even passages would have been very, very good. The next war, I'm going to recommend that for uh, survival uh, equipment. Okay, good. Bring us up to May of 1945, uh, the war's over, literally over. Right. There, it, it ended roughly in the first week, seventh, eighth or something in Europe, right. at least. Uh, I have here that your camp was not evacuated until the 15th. What happened in that week? Why weren't you over? Well, 
Uh, first of all, you've got to remember that uh, the, the Russians who had come into our area, they were led by a, a, gen a uh, Russian general who was uh, educated in the Russian military, I guess, and he, uh, he was the lord and king. And whatever he said goes, it didn't, it didn't matter to him that it was in the best interest of, uh, of Russia or the Allies. They almost felt that they were so good that they, this is my feeling, that they were so good that they were better than, than the uh, Western Allies, um, English and, and French, uh, English and um, Americans and Canadians. So that RCO had to negotiate everything that happened. Now they got into our camp around the 1st of May in 1945. The Russians did. The Russians, yes. They had advanced parties coming. Um, they had advanced parties c coming through. We were prepared for them, and we had people who spoke Russian in uh, in our in our group. So we had um, some sort of knowledge. However, the the um, scuttlebutt must have been wildfire going. Absolutely, your camp. everybody had a yeah. theory about. I heard, I heard, but our own CO, Colonel Zemke, said, don't leave the camp. We had men who, matter of fact, the fellow who was flying first pilot on my plane left with a few other people. They just walked out of camp and headed west. A dangerous thing to do. They made it all right, but I spoke to him recently, and he's there had a couple of harrowing nights, but... Uh, the um, the Russians gave found them and they gave them a, a captured car which they drove into the American uh, or, or British lines and from then on they were free. Well, we we stayed an extra ten days or a week or so on. What did the Russians do to the Germans? The, the are you speaking of the population at your camp. Had the Germans oh, fled? The Germans left. The okay. Germans they, left. They took off. Correct. All right, there was one man who was, um, he was in the hierarchy of the, um, of Stalag Luft I, German, who was a particularly nasty guy. And when Colonel Zemke was dealing with the, uh, with the Russian general, he had seen this man who was now dressed as a civilian, who was a, an advisor to the Russians. And Colonel Zemke asked the general, you know, what is he doing? He's, he's helping us. He says, do you know who this is? And he said, he's a civilian who's Just helping us. Just a kindly passerby. Yeah. Correct. Well, Colonel Zemke put him straight on who the man was and what he had done. They never saw him again. I guess the Russians disposed of him. Tell us about leaving the camp. Well, they told us that oh, we wait would... wait a minute. I'm sorry. You told us, or you told us earlier, that you knew you were going to leave the camp and had sense enough to go get your records. Well, it wasn't our sense. The Colonel Zempi, again, we had a tremendous organization. We had our own men in the guard towers. We had our own people up in there in the German headquarters. And when the Germans left, they didn't destroy it. Anything. They just left. So uh, they told, our people told Colonel Zempi that the records were intact in their office. And then he made an announcement that every barracks would be called, the barracks commander would be called, and he could take up to 200 men from the barracks up to the records section and retrieve your camp records. And amongst them was a, um, a card, it was a kind of a, a dull red color. And it had all your records, your name, your uh, home address, your mother's name or parent's name. Um, what you flew, where you were shot down, and so on. And there were two mug shots, the profile and the, and the head-on, plus a miniature card, and uh, again, the two mug shots. So each person, it was very orderly, so that you went up by barracks and then by alphabet. Everything was done alphabetically. We, uh, I'm sorry, by barracks and alphabetically, so they knew where everybody was. And it was very easy to get the records out. At home, I somewhere I have that full sheet of uh, my my information that the Germans wanted. The Americans always told us our our um, officers, always superior officers, always told us 
name, rank, and serial number, nothing else. Well, that's not very practical, because as soon as you write a letter, they've got your home address and who your parents are or were. So there was nothing secret about that. Actually, speaking of that, uh, we were told never to talk about where we bombed or where our missions went to, but I wrote my mother a letter and I said, uh, I'm okay with flying and everything is fine. And, but by the way, I was over your old hometown the other day. She was born in, in Hanover, Germany, and that was our target for a day. <laughs> so I, she got the drift of it when, when I finally did get home. Sneaking by the sensor there. <laughs> yeah, well, it, I, where was our hometown? They didn't know, you know. Where did you go? 10,000 guys, the, the, the Brits, I assume, went in their direction and you went in yours? Yes. Uh, where, but, did, where did you go and how? Well, the, uh, the, first of all, they had it clear through the Russians, and the Russian general had it clear through his superiors to give, to give a uh, fly path so that the planes coming over could only fly over that fly path in case there were any pockets of resisting Germans. So the planes flew in on this fly path and um, they told us to be patient. There would be plane load after plane load. There would be a, a round robin uh, pick up and deliver situation. And you were marched or walked by, by barracks up to the aircraft it was all B-17s that came in, and they... How appropriate for you. Yes, uh, and actually, a uh, strange coincidence, the plane that I flew out on was a Triangle K. That was my bomb group. And I met the... They flew with a pilot, co-pilot, flight engineer, and radio operator, the four, four people. Uh, they didn't even need a navigator, because they, they knew exactly you know, where they were going. Um, they flew in and they loaded the planes and, and flew out and we flew to a field in, um, in France near the coast. How uh, many of you guys could jam into a B-17? Well, it wasn't right exactly jam because they had, a, they had a, taken into a, a consideration the way that they, the, the load was uh, carried on the plane. They couldn't put everybody in, uh, in one position. The plane wasn't constructed that way. but. Uh, there were not, no bombs in the bomb way, so they could take extra load. So they, the uh, radio room, which was directly behind the bomb, bomb bay, and the nose um, took a few people. The rest of us were just sitting on a floor down near the waste guns. Now, we didn't go up to any high altitude, so we didn't need oxygen. No oxygen, yeah. And the pilot announced that uh, they were going to fly low level, 5,000 feet, to show us the damage that uh, the Eighth Air Force had done. Did you fly over particular cities that had any that you had bombed? No, I, I don't recall exactly. We just saw destruction, um, and again we had to stay within a fly path that the Russians had, uh, up to the point where the Allies were. Then they could fly anywhere they wanted. You got to France, and then where? We went to a camp called Lucky Strike. They, they had several camps: Camp Chesterfield, Lucky Strike. Cigarettes. Cigarettes. <laughs> Remember the old saying, Lucky, uh, Lucky Strike, Strike Green, Green has gone, gone to war. war. Yeah. <laughs> it was white, white packs, and there's still white packs today. But uh, cigarettes were in demand all over. It was our, our commodity of training in the POW camp. But Camp Lucky Strike was nothing but recovered uh, prisoners, and they issued us a new pair of shoes, three pairs of stocks, three changes of underwear, and coveralls, two sets of coveralls, no uniforms. So that guy could ri get rid of his magic box finally. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, they're kind of baggy, but uh, I... Did, did they send you home from there? Eventually. They told us that we had to wait for the ships to come in. And uh, another fellow, also from New York, um, Fred McBride, he was... Uh, a pretty good pitcher in baseball, and um, his team used to play against our team. We lived in adjacent neighborhoods, so that we were fairly friendly. But we came, became very good friends, and we hitched a ride into Paris. We went AWOL, and um, somebody told us we could pick up a partial pay at uh, at an office, and we had no identification. We had nothing. We we just knew our serial numbers, 
and we got $150 each. So he went to the Army PX in Paris and bought a pair of pink slacks and, uh, and a regular shirt, a uh, chino shirt. I forget what they called it then, it wasn't chino. That's to go with the jacket you bought in London. Yeah, well, yeah, it was the same thing, but a suntan type color. And uh, we got a billet, and we went and had some decent food and just bummed around Paris for a little. We went to uh, the castle in, in France called the Dufayel, and uh, this is where General de Gaulle was welcomed as a hero uh, when he came back from England to France. Anyway, we got back. After three days, we got a ride back to Camp Lucky Strike, and, and we just waited for our boat. And I, in the first interview, I said we had a celebrity actor who was a chief bosun's mate. It was a brand new ship, maiden voyage, and a chief bosun's mate on that ship was Victor Mature, who was a, a hunk, as they say today, a hot throb. And he wore... He got an oil change in his hair every yeah, three months. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tremendous tan. I think he came across on a sunny trip and it was bare-waisted. But his shirt was not, was not buttoned military style. It was open down to his navel, just about. He looked the part. You know, and everybody kidded him. Nice guy. And everybody kidded with him. And it was a very pleasant trip. Slow, was six days. And we landed in Boston. And, uh, that's all behind now. Were you really. discharged at Boston, or was that the end? No, uh, from Boston we went down. They, the trains used to pull into what is now the World Trade Center. They had actual tracks going in. They took us down to Taunton, to Camp Miles Standish, uh, until they could get us transported down to Atlantic City. That was to be our, our discharge station. And uh, from there I had my papers, then went back home. And while home, I uh, developed the hepatitis. I had developed it earlier, the incubation period, I guess, of some time. And I went back to military control because the army took, took me in and uh, I went to various hospitals, uh, eventually winding up in a hospital in um, Carl Gables, Florida. The, uh, I think it's the Wiltshire Hotel. It's a very famous resort today, still there. And I was living the life of Riley, and Riley wasn't home. And uh, that's the best way. Yeah. Well, we had I had they had army buses that were taking us up to Hialeah Racetrack, and we had a little money that we had partial pays that we got back pays. So we enjoyed the day at the racetrack, or we went over to the beach. One of the ho several hotels had opened their facilities to returning servicemen, and uh, we had a. Uh, a changing room and a locker and the use of the beach and anything else we had to pay for, you know, any uh, food or drinks and so on. But that was a that was a wonderful, wonderful. My best military experience was being down in in Carl Gables at that hospital. Made up for the long lousy winter. I and and yeah. yes, that's right. And the uh, conditions in the camp. Henry, we're we're drawing to a close here. Um, I've got about two or three questions I'd like to ask you. Sure. Can you account for the huge difference in the treatment you got from the Germans at that camp and what the Germans simultaneously were doing at other camps in Germany and Poland? I don't know if I could account for it accurately, but I would say one of the factors was the fact that it was an officer's camp. and. The Germans were very compassionate about seeking their levels of respect. So the, uh, the courtesy of a German general was extended to an American or British general and vice versa. Uh, and it went down by rank, down the line. So that um, the highest rank in a non-controlling um, situation in our camp was a Lieutenant Colonel, and we had several of those. We had quite a few more majors and then a lot more captains. And in general, the uh, barracks commander was a captain, and then first lieutenants and second lieutenants. So the, the fact that our camp was, 
as I said before, the Cadillac of the camps was due to the fact that the camp was basically an officer's camp mm -hmm. by German choice. Not we didn't decide where we were going. They respected you as military men then. Right. Yeah. That's the way it was. And we had no control over that. Okay, I'm going to give you two quotes here. Um, the first is, is, imprisonment is a form of psychological trauma. And the second is from a man named Terry Anderson. You may remember him as the AP Bureau Chief in Lebanon who was held right. almost seven years. Right. And he said, being held against your will like that is the ultimate bummer which I think pretty well sums up captivity like that. Would you comment on being held a prisoner of war six months against well, your will? Terry Anderson was an individual being held in a society that did not respect life as it was known in Europe or in, the, in our continent. So being an individual, he had nobody to lean on, to commiserate with, or to, uh, to pal around with. It was a different situation. So I would say that that was much more uh, taxing and rough on, on the individual, both in his mental capacity and his physical capacity, too. Remember, as I said earlier, we had the use of athletic equipment, so if you were so inclined, we even had people who took when the camp was expanded, the curb stones, and they got the use of a hammer and chisel, and they made concrete blocks in various sizes, and they chiseled out holes, and they got a pipe, and they were using these as, um, as weights for a weightlifting exercise. But we had each other, and uh, that, that went a long way to soften the, uh, the fact that we were prisoners. It was no picnic, but it was... Uh, not many men that went around the bend, in, in, at least in our camp. <clears throat> I guess one, one of my last questions to you. All of this was 55 years ago. Do you ever wake up at night, think about this? No, no it's long gone. I, I, it never even really bothered me in the camp. We. Um, we knew we were there. We knew it wouldn't be forever. It was just a matter of time. But I never had any trauma about being held captive or any of the things that, not even from day one when I came home, it was, that was it. It was gone. So it couldn't have been all that bad. The, uh, the fact that uh, we had each other, I think, got us through the, uh, that being captive. Henry, we've had two shots at this. Is there anything we haven't asked you that you want to put on the record? Well, the one thing I neglected to tell you is, from the very beginning, we crossed this country in a covered wagon train, and that was very rough because the Indians were shooting at us, surrounding us, burning the wagon. So that was the, the toughest part of, of my life, crossing the country in a covered wagon train. Yes, <laughs> and you've aged very gracefully. I well, I was a previous life. I forget who I was then. <laughs> Bill Cody, I think, was my name. <laughs> Wild Bill. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It Thank was you a, very much. A pleasure to have uh, sit, uh, been interviewed by you and to sit here and at least give my uh, my version of what happened. We're glad to have had and you. And it was here. all the truth. Believe me, I may have embellished here and there, but. <laughs>